Jackie Nashville, uh, part of the uh, leadership of the Davidson County Republican Party, part of the leadership of the Tennessee Republican Party, and has had her problems with the leadership there. Jackie, good to have you on. we got Sheriff Clark coming in as well. Give us an update. What's going on? Sure. Hey, John. Thanks for having me on. So um, right now, I would say, you know, the delegate, <laughs> <laughs> the delegate drama continues in Tennessee. And I, if I could dovetail, because I listened to Ann, I've been on the line listening. And it's a nice dovetail because what <laughs> Ann is talking about, what goes behind the scenes when states either see delegates that win they don't like, they want to put their friends in. What this speaks to is the civil war that's going on within the Republican Party. And people don't talk about this to not enough, and I know it's not – no one likes being in a civil war, okay? But you have a gnarly fight in the Republican Party, as I see it, from my vantage point, from my experience. You have Trump loyalists. And then you got the old school Republicans. People call them ride, call them whatever you will. I don't like rhino; it's too cute um, for my taste. But what I would call it is the establishment or the older school Republicans. Their major concern, and this is ground zero for the drama with all the delegate BS that Tennessee has been going through. They don't think Trump's conservative enough. Okay, this is their whether they come out and say it or not. And Ann was alluding to this. Okay. Now, Trump has proved you overturned Roe v. Wade. This is where me as a, a MAGA Republican, John, starts to get a little like, uh, you know, he's not conservative enough. Well, guess what? Sometimes people who are really, really conservative, they don't really like to talk to people with differing opinions. OK, sometimes people that are on the far right have a difficult time listening to or accepting someone else within the Republican Party that doesn't parrot every single conservative talking point. Now, Trump, to his credit, has always governed like a conservative. I think people are projecting onto Trump. Um, I'm unsure why that is. He's the most popular president in the Republican ticket since Reagan. And he has a whole force of people, John, you know this. He has a force of people working within leadership in state GOPs that don't like him. They don't like his followers. They don't like his loyalists. And this is where it all stems from. They want to continue to control the messaging on things like platform committees. And there's all these little knife fights that go on. And it's to control the messaging and it's to set the tone uh, for topics and issues moving forward. It's a, and Jackie, that's you, where the knife look, fight you, stems you, from. You you look, you, you're right on all counts. You, and I'm going to bring Sheriff David Clark in here. By the way, David, awesome. uh, clubs, Cubs suck, Astros suck, we all suck. So let's just get that out of the way. Uh, but, uh, uh, Jackie, you're, you're 100% right. And, you know, I'm on the platform committee. I'm going to be fighting battles there. And it's the yep. old guard that wants yep. to control this and control that. And they're being they, they don't understand the party has moved away from them. This is Trump's party. It's a populist party. Right. It's all new. They don't like it. They want to go back where yep. they can go and they can go to the platform committee and they can go to the yeah. rules and they can do what they want. Those <laughs> days are over and they're hanging on for dear life. And True. it's painful for them, Jackie. It's painful. They have been in control of this apparatus for years and years and years. Nobody you meet there that's in control of it is under 70. I mean, is, it, 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 they're all 75 years old. And they're, they're just clinging it because it's the only thing they got in their life. And we've seen it no, no matter where you, where you go. They're a cycle away from being replaced. One cycle away, they're all going to be gone. We're going to be in control of this party. Uh, but you're seeing it in the platform committee. They want to control it. They're not. And they got people like me on it that really don't give a rat's ass what they say. So and in that's, Tennessee, the, John, that's why they're so upset. Yes. And in, in, in Tennessee, and I know the platform committee is like the crown jewel out of all the committees, right? And, and I get that. Now, what Tennessee has done with their committees, and I'm exceptionally proud of this. I'm exceptionally excited about this. Um, you have young Republicans. Young Republicans who won, who, mind you, leadership didn't even want to, to keep because they weren't alive long enough to meet the bona fides, okay? They have made it onto committees. And this gives me hope 
in, in excitement. Yeah, I get it. Look, I mean, the whole thing's a mess. All right, I want to bring in uh, Sheriff David Clark. Sheriff, thank you for your patience. Uh, we're backed up. We, we had a couple of uh, irate callers <laughs> and made about Bob Good getting his getting his ass kicked last night uh, by John McGuire and losing, I guess. So uh, we got Jackie Colbathon. She's in leadership GOP in Tennessee in the Nashville area. Sheriff Clark, as you know, America's sheriff in Wisconsin. Uh, Sheriff, I want to start with with kind of what Jackie said here. That's got this old guard hanging on, and you've seen it play out in Wisconsin. You got a candidate for Senate that can't win. I mean, they put up a guy that is self funding. Uh, I've never met him. I don't know anything about him, but I'm just reading about this guy. He can't win. I mean, he's a he's a dreadful candidate. The guy puts his foot in his mouth every other day. He st- I don't even know what he stands for. And, and Tammy Baldwin is going to make mincemeat of this guy. Is that not part still? of the problem, Sheriff, with the old guard nominating people that can't win? Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, Jackie, first of all, uh, better you than me, you know, that you're in this <laughs> position of leadership. To, to, and you're going to have to put this fractured party back together in the end. First of all, a couple of observations. You can't be afraid of the fight. you got to have these fights. Yeah. If we're going to shake things up, we need boat rockers. You have the old guard that is a protector of the status quo, and they're just trying to hang on and become more like the other side than, than acting like true conservatives. You know, when people ask me whose side I'm on, I always say, I'm on my side. I'm on the side of the republic. I'm on the side of the Constitution, due process, on and on and on and on. And people have to realize, and I don't want to sound like I'm lecturing when I say people need to realize but they got to put their selfish interests aside and, and start voting in terms of what's in the best interest of the country, not the party, the country, because we have too many mm. people in Washington, D.C., and, and, and in part in, in state government in the GOP that don't have the interests of their state or the, the, the country. Look at the massive spending. I could go, I could take an hour talking about the way they behave in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking about the GOP. So in the end, though, you know, it's got to be one team, one goal. A lot of people are going to be hurt and wounded, and they'll walk away like they did in Georgia, which is why Herschel Walker ended up losing and flipped the, the or kept the Senate in uh, Democrat hands because people went away wounded when they had the runoff as, uh, as to the one way wounded after what happened in the general election. And that's why I said it's going to take strong leadership to remind people. And so you got to have the, the, the you got to use the language. This isn't about good. This isn't about McGuire. This isn't about, it's not even about Trump. It's about the country. Don't make it about people. Make it about the country. Hmm. Jack, you want to respond to that? Uh, Sheriff Clark, a uh, big fan of you. Thank you for your service, sir. Um, I, I think that's a beautiful sentiment, and that really puts things into perspective because politics is mathematics, right? And sometimes people don't understand. You can have an amazing candidate, but the place in which they live um, might not be supporting that. But we have sort of moved beyond, to Sheriff Clark's point, I emphatically agree, we move beyond party. We Our country's on the brink. Our country is in trouble. Our country trumps the interests of inter-party BS. And if people keep their eye on the North Star, which is the safety and security of our country, I do believe, after pondering that, that that is something that people can get together behind, is that sentiment of what is good for us and also teamwork. Sheriff Clark knows what it's like to be a member of a team. And when you're a member of a team, you have one goal. You don't have 50 people's different <laughs> motives, goals, all moving around, okay, and competing for airspace. It's one goal, and it is the only winning formula. It's the only winning formula. So, listen, uh, uh, it, the, way, the path we're going down now is we got to just take this party over. And this is what we've been saying, Precinct 2.0. Jackie, you're part of it. We inspired you to get involved. 
And if you look at what Jackie went through and how they tried to oust her uh, at every turn, I mean, they just don't want you. I mean, you look at what happened to me. I moved to Pennsylvania, ran for delegate there, eight people in the race. They put me number eight on the ballot, told me it was drawn out of a hat. Right. Don't not believe that. I'm number eight. I have to raise, you know, thirty five thousand uh, dollars to win. Uh, which I did, which I did, ran a campaign. Everybody said there was, I had zero. Even when we were sitting there, Ann and I handing out my flyers, the people that were that were running against us were telling, well, you, Ann, you know, you understand you're not going to win. You're not from here. People don't know you. You're not going to win. But, you know, good try. This is what they were t- telling us at noon. And uh, we led the ticket and beat everybody in a landslide. So they don't want you there, right? You had the Speaker of the House yelling at my wife, telling her to go back to Virginia. And she's like, uh, sir, this is, I live in Pittsburgh. Like, you know, this is Speaker of the House. They don't want new people. But right. here's the reality. They got them, okay? They got them, and now we're going to oust them all. <laughs> they, we're going to oust them all, including Tennessee and everything else. And look, they still got, you know, they still got ties to some of the – you know, some of the people they need, but it's it's people like you and I are, are taking this thing over. Sheriff Clark, uh, I, I, I got to get, uh, I got to do baseball for a second, then we get back to po- politics. Jackie, hang there with us. Um, two things. Number one, Astros and the Cubs are combined 18 and a half games out. You're eight and a half out. I'm 10 out. Season for the Astros is over. Alvarez is hurt. Verlander's hurt. Oral pitches are hurt. Now Tucker's hurt. Nobody's playing. We can't score runs. Now we're getting beat by the White Sox to add insult to injury. Got beat last night, 10 games out. No way to make the wild card. No way to make up 10 games. Season over. Time to sell. Right? Cubs, same position. Uh, it's, all, it's all bad. Having said that, um, yeah. as, you get, as you get older... People that you followed as a child start dying. And, uh, you know, it kind of hit me when Jimmy when the Toy Cannon died, who he was my boyhood baseball idol uh, when I was when he was with the Astros yesterday. Willie Mays, 93, gone. Um, when you saw that, Sheriff, tell me your tell me your first reaction. Yeah, I remember as a kid, uh, Willie Mays playing. And, you know, it, it seems to. We've had a streak lately, you know, with Bill Walton, with Jerry West. And, and I know people die every day. I get that. But there are people who are kind of markers in history. And, and that's why I point out the, the names that I do. Uh, because of what they achieved, not only on the court, but off the court and off the field. Uh, he was a pioneer. You know, he started out in the Negro League. I think he was the 10th. I think I heard he was the 10th. Um, black player to play in the in the major <laughs> leagues coming out of the uh, the Negro League. So, you know, that's historic. That's a marker. Uh, and baseball finally started to get it. So, yeah, uh, you know, it's just too bad that, you know, he's 93 years old, but it's just too bad that in his days following baseball, he wasn't <clears throat> uh, held up more by Major League Baseball <laughs> as a, a symbol of the progress made in, in, in Major League Baseball and what he stood for. You know, the guy off the field, no problems, no scandals, nothing like that. So, of course, he'll be missed. Um, I, you know, I just hope that other players who, uh, who who were standing on his shoulders and are now making millions and millions and millions playing Major League Baseball keep that in mind that this isn't about them. <clears throat> there were people who came before him, and they need to be acknowledged. You know, growing up, um, I'm 66, so growing up, I remember him uh, playing with the San Francisco Giants. And um, back then, you know, baseball was not like it is today where you can get the MLB app and I could watch every Astro game that I choose to um, uh, choose to pain myself with these, these days and go through that delusion. But, um, you know, you can only see baseball uh, with the Mets. I grew up in New Jersey, so we had Mets and Yankees. That was it. And uh, so we watched the Mets games, and you only saw the Giants is when they played the Mets, and I didn't stay up when they were on the West Coast. I was a, I was too young. So when they went to Shea Stadium and they played the Giants, and I remember my father would you know tell me about all the individual players, and I remember when the Giants had them, uh, they had the what they called the second murderer's row, which was Mays, McCovey, and Hart. Of course, Willie Mays hit third. Uh, McCovey hit fourth, and then Jim Ray Hart hit like 50 homers a season, hit fifth. That was called Murderer's Row. 
I remember watching him play, and then I remember when he was at the end of his career and he got uh, traded to the Mets uh, when he was about to retire. He had another season in him. The Mets ended up going to the World Series that season. He got to play against Oakland. I think he got a couple hits. Um, you know, you kind of go back and you remember that, and you remember the what he brought to the game, and there was a wholesomeness there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, back then baseball yeah. was wholesome. Uh, not that it's not today. I'm not saying it isn't, but it was very wholesome back then. And even though there were scandals with Mickey Mantle and stuff, you never really heard about him. The, you know, the, until Ball Four came out with Jim Bowden, they were the you know the media kind of protected uh, the mantles of the world and uh, the Whitey F- Fords, whatever. But uh, it was wholesome. I'm in this Cape Cod. My son's in this Cape Cod league. And one of the things that Ann and I said, going to these games or played in high school fields, the fields are grass and dirt. Uh, there's no turf. Uh, most of them don't have lights. You p- play at, you know, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the stands are bleachers. Tons this is, uh, what, dear? Tons of kids running tons, around. Tons of kids, Ann was saying. T- everybody brings their kids. So there's tons of little kids running around, playing catch, going after foul balls. You know, you, you go to these games in the Cape Cod League, uh, Sheriff, and uh, I, I got to bring you out here one day because it's really the way baseball was meant to be. That's the baseball we grew up with, you know, back in the day, playing in a little league or playing in high school. And, you know, there were no lights and turfs and all this stuff. And you had little kids running around. Um, and so the game, you know, the game lives on. And all of us that grew up with him will always remember Willie Mays, just like in basketball, you're always going to remember Jerry West driving down the lane. You're going to remember Bill Walton, uh, Trailblazers down 2-0 to Philadelphia. Uh, Portland brought him back single-handedly, third game, scored like 48. They couldn't stop him with that hook. You know, these are the things that you remember. Now they're dead. And so as you get older, I don't know if it's nostalgia or you think, you know what, who's going to be after that? But am I making any sense at all? Sheriff. Yeah, you're making a lot of sense. I'm glad you use that word wholesome. You know, baseball used to be a part of Americana. There was there was that one commercial, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it's kind of gotten away from that. It's become more corporate now. But it is a business. I get that. But it's become more corporate than, than it used to be. It used to, the activity happened on the field. Now it happens off the field. You've got guys switching teams. You, you almost need a, a, a roster with every game because you don't know who's been traded, who moved in the off season, so on and so forth, where you knew guys like Mays, you knew San Francisco Giants. And you can go through a lot of other these, uh, many of these other people in, in baseball and also professional sports, and they were associated with a team. Now I mean, you got guys with free agency, and I'm not speaking against that, but, I mean, there's no identity. It's not Americana anymore. Well, now, now you have to identify with the team or the city and not the player, which was where the link was. I remember 1968, so I was 10 years old, uh, and my two favorite players on Houston was Rusty Staub and Jimmy Wynn, and they traded Rusty Staub, and I heard it on the radio, and I was 10 years old, and they traded him with think the Montreal Expos. That was an expansion team. And I remember I cried for like an hour. And uh, I didn't understand it. I'm yeah. like, well, what? it's my yeah. my favorite player. I mean, what? Why'd they trade him? You know. And uh, my father was trying to explain it to me, and I just cried for an hour. That well, what do you, what do you mean he went? Who's Montreal? Like what? <laughs> like what? what? <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't get it. And of course, yeah. you know, now these players yeah. move every day. But I bawled for an hour, and uh, my dad had to console me and said, you know, it's part of base baseball. He got tr- traded. Doesn't mean he's dead. You know. And uh, so that's what happened. <laughs> Sheriff you know Clark, oh, I, well, of course, you know, as I got older, I started to be a hater, and I just hate everybody except my players, so I'm kind of that way now. But, you know, back then I was only 10. Nobody taught me to hate. <laughs> now I'm a baseball hater. I hate everybody except my players on my team. And as soon as they get traded, I hate them too. Or they go in free agency. Except George Springer gets a pass. Two people get a pass. George Springer, because he stutters, obvious reasons, he gets a pass, lifetime. And Marwin Gonzalez, who's since retired, who hit the home run off Kennel, whatever his name is, Johnson or whatever his name is, uh, in the third game of the LA, second game of the LA series to tie it. 
with two outs in the top of the ninth. He gets a pass. Other than that, I hate them all. 